click subscribe, click the thumbs up on our messages, click the little bell. Get your friends saved, get your family saved. Good evening, welcome to our midweek service. Let's go ahead and stand here in the sanctuary tonight. And uh, if you're watching live and you're able to do so, go ahead and stand, give God the honor while we pray. Father Yahweh Elohim, we thank you for another uh, great uh, day and great week. And we thank you, Father God, for your blessing upon each and every one of us. Father God, in giving us uh, this day our daily bread. Father, we ask for our daily bread tomorrow and for every day for the rest of this week and this month and this year. In Jesus' name, for all those that are here, all those that are watching, and all those that peer into our ministry, even momentarily. Father, we thank you for that now in Jesus' name. We ask for a blessing over this sanctuary and over our, our team uh, and uh, all those that are watching. And we'll watch into the future that not one word would be stolen from them. And Father, we thank you for that also in Jesus' name. And Father, I ask uh, that Kathy and I would uh, speak out your marvelous truths here tonight as we discuss uh, the history of the Bible. In Jesus' name, and not one word would be robbed from anyone. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You're welcome to take your seats, ushers, if you would, here in the sanctuary. If you are watching or you're participating in any of our services, become a regular financial partner with this ministry. Uh, God will reward you back. It will be money amen. well spent, and you'll always be pulling on this ministry and on me for the Word of God when we're getting it, rather than just uh, leaning back and, uh, and just taking it in. You'll really be pulling on this ministry. And you don't even have to be given all that much, quite frankly, just to get that pull uh, that I call that pull. And anyway, you can go to our website, mountainfaith.org. Finally, uh, if you're watching and you have not yet downloaded our mobile app, go to our website, mountainfaith.org, get the mobile app. You get daily devos, all kinds of exciting things on there. You can watch live from the app, mobile app. You can give through the mobile app. It's just wonderful. All right. So uh, this is week number three um, as we're talking more about the Bible and about uh, we started out talking about the Apocrypha. Right. And if you want to know more about that and you don't know what we're talking about, then go back uh, on YouTube, particularly on YouTube, because that's the edited version, and you can read that. Now, last week, we began to talk about the timeline of the different, of how the Bible has come to be constructed as we know it today. Right. And what we got into uh, last week is we started talking about uh, Martin, Lu Martin Luther, and we talked about uh, the the uh, Latin Bible that was that was the Bible for most churches, uh, whether they were Protestant or not, for 1,500 years. And so I'm just going to do a tiny bit of review. What we didn't get up to last week, Kathy, is we didn't get up to the King James Bible. And so I want to talk about the King James Bible tonight, and then I want to talk about what Luther did to the King James Bible. And also, I want to talk about whether or not the King James Bible is really a Protestant Bible. It's considered a Protestant Bible, but we're going to look at the origins of that fairly in depth tonight. Right. Then we're going to go over and talk about uh, Martin Luther, and we're going to talk about what he did with the Apocrypha, what he did with the Bible, and what happened after he died, what the, the changes that he made to the Bible, how those changes were uh, kind of eased off on and it probably was a good thing. So uh, if you have your mind open and your Bible's open, we're just gonna, I'm just going to do some reading. Uh, uh, in 1205, uh, Stephen Langston, a theology professor and later Archbishop of Canterbury, creates the first chapter divisions in the books of the Bible. So we have chapter divisions in the books of the Bible today. Those have only been there, Kathy, for 800 years. Wow. And so Jesus didn't have chapter divisions like we have them today uh, and verse divisions. So we have that. And then that was copied later on by a rabbi who was doing editing for the Jewish uh, Hebrew Bible, which is the old, we call the Old Testament. And that was done, uh, that was done about 125 years later. So now the Jews and Christians all have their Bibles delineated pretty much the same. In fact, most Jewish Bibles, uh, if they're off at all, they're off one verse or they start a chapter with the previous verse from the last verse of the chapter, if that makes any sense. And so uh, many times you'll see if you have a, if you have a, a, a truly Jewish Bible, a Tanakh, uh, sometimes the last verse 
of the last chapter is the first verse of the new chapter. Not all the time. So the Christians did it first, and then the Jews followed. Right, the, and the Jews followed. Right, right, right. In um, 1382 A.D., of course, uh, John Wycliffe and his associates in defiance of the organized church, believing that people should be permitted to read the Bible in their own language, began to translate and produce the first handwritten manuscripts of the entire Bible in English. These included 39 Old Testament books, 27 New Testament books and 14 Apocrypha books. And again, this Apocrypha thing is a really big deal. A lot of people haven't really followed the fuss over it. That's right. Uh, but it, it, is, it is a really big deal. It's a big deal because it's been there and taken out and put back in and taken out. Right. People are only looking at the last maybe, what, 100 years? It, 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 but it's been, yeah. but the Apocrypha has been around for, you know, thousands. Right. So, right. yeah. yeah Apocrypha has been around for 2,500 years anyway. Yeah, I, didn't, I didn't even realize that history. And by the way, John Wycliffe, they produced handwritten Bibles. So uh, they produced, um, I don't know how many they produced, but they, they didn't actually produce all that many. Uh, I have that number here. Anyway, so uh, the Bibles were handwritten and they had beautiful graphics. Can you imagine having a handwritten Bible? I right. just think that that would be wonderful. Yeah. Uh, to, and there weren't very many of them uh, that were done. Uh, but later on, 44 years after his death, uh, the church hated him so much that they had his bones dug up, uh, uh, crushed, and then scattered into the river uh, in order to symbolize that he'd been cast out of the church. I think it was a little late after he died. I think so. Um, but, you know, some people get so mad, they just, they're, they're, not, they're not realist, right? It's not that, even Christian. <laughs> So that's not even a Christian behavior, really. Okay, after the, in 1455, now this happened back in uh, 1381, 1382. Uh, in 1455, after the invention of the printing press, Johannes Gutenberg produces the first printed Bible, this is in 1455, in the Latin Vulgate. So the first, very first printed Bible was the Latin Vulgate Bible. And it was, it was, Printed then, and then later on, oh, we'll talk about that. So this is some of the stuff we talked about last week. In uh, 1516, a guy named Erasmus produces a Greek New Testament, a forerunner to the Texas, uh, Texas Repsis. It was a milestone that it was the first non-Latin Vulgate text of the scripture to be produced in a thousand years. So this is only 520 well, 22 years ago, 522 years ago. So all these changes to the Bible have been predominantly recent. So up until uh, 1500s, uh, the, only, the only Bibles that you could get were in Greek, in Hebrew, or in Latin. All right, and, and the whole world wasn't just speaking those three languages. You got uh, French, you got German, you have English, and, or, and, and English was on the rise significantly at that time. So Martin Luther was responsible for the German version. Right, right, and I'm going to read that in a moment. So in 1516, we see the first Greek New Testament forerunner. It was the first non-Latin Vulgate text to be uh, produced in a millennium. All right, so uh, that was really exciting. All right, and, and the, the reason why is because they found that the the recopies and recopies of the Latin Vulgate had gotten, uh, remember, it's not being printed off of computer. It's being handwritten. So many changes have been made to it, and the Latin Vulgate was supposed to be an exact copy off of the Greek Old Testament, which was produced right around 200 B.C., and there were so many changes and so many errors, not on misspellings, but on just that these, all these men that were doing this were saying that it would be hard to be a Christian reading the Latin Vulgate at that time because so many changes had been made to the Latin Vulgate. Mm -hmm. And of course, they, you, know, you weren't keeping Bibles for a thousand years, so you didn't have an original to go back to. Right? So uh, he went back to the original Greek. Uh, when I say original Greek, he went back to the Greek uh, Bible that was called the 70 Bible because it was produced by 70 uh, interpreters of the Hebrew into Greek for Jews that wanted to be able to read their Tanakh in their Greek language. If they were living outside the country, they were, were already you know, reading Greek and learning Greek and whatever. Okay. All right. In 1517, just one year later, 
Uh, Martin Luther uh, had a small um, uh, start as Luther declared intolerance for the Roman Church's corruption on Halloween 1517, uh, nailed his 95 theses uh, to the Wittenberg uh, Catholic Church door. Luther would be exiled uh, later on. And so he wants to publish, Luther published a German uh, Pentateuch in 1523, about five years later. Uh, so Luther is taking the Bible. And most of the time he's taking the uh, Bible that, he's taking the Latin Vulgate, which already had a lot of error. So you said Pentateuch, that's just the first five the, books of the Bible. Thank you, thank you. The Pentateuch is the first five books of the Old Testament. So that's, that's uh, Genesis, uh, Exodus, Exodus, Deuteronomy, Leviticus. Leviticus, and Numbers, right? Right. So those first five books of the Bible, and Penta meaning five. So he, he published the German Pentateuch in 1523, and another edition of the, uh, of, of the New Testament in 1529, and by the 1530s, he was publishing um, uh, the entire Bible in German. William Tyndale, now just a couple of years later, produces the first translation of the New Testament from Greek, from the Greek, not from the Latin, but from Greek into English. And he had the distinction of being the first man to ever print the New Testament in the English language, William Tyndale. All right, not Martin Luther. Right. All right, Tyndale was a true scholar and a genius, so fluid in eight languages that it was said that any one of um, them uh, seemed to be his native tongue. So he was very, very wise. In uh, 1516, he wanted to use the same uh, Erasmus text as a source to translate and print up the New Testament English for the first time. He showed up on Luther's doorstep in 1525 and by year end had translated the New Testament into English. So he goes to Luther and they converse and Luther's translating the Bible into German. Tyndale wants to translate it into English, which he right. ends up doing. It's called the Tyndale Bible. And it became the first printed edition of the scripture in the English language. All right. And then subsequent Bibles were translated. But we have not yet. We're still in the 1500s. We haven't got up to the 1611 translation of the King James English, of, of the King James Bible. All right. In 1535, Miles Coverdale's Bible uh, com uh, completes Tyndale's work, producing the first complete printed Bible in the English language. It included, again, 39 Old Testament books, 27 New Testament books, and 14 Apocrypha books. So we see in 1535, or 400 and, oh, 490 years ago, uh, we have an English translation complete with the Apocrypha. And again, if you don't know what the Apocrypha is, we talked about that at length last week. In 1536, Martin Luther translates the Old Testament in the commonly spoken dialect of the German people, completing his translation of the entire Bible in German. So he had several uh, translations come out. So Tyndale uh, was uh, condemned as a heretic. He was strangled and burnt at the stake for making this English uh, translation. It wasn't, isn't that terrible? Uh, it is. And then in 1537, uh, the Matthew Bible, known as the Matthew Tyndale Bible, became the complete, uh, second complete printed English translation of the Bible. So people were so against having an English translation of the Bible, your life was in jeopardy just for having it. Look at what the devil does to keep us from actually reading the word and understanding it. That's right. That's right. You know, Amen. and legalism, uh, legalism is one of the greatest forces against Christianity, not for Christianity. And how do you know it's not because they don't want the average person or anyone outside the laity to be able to interpret the word? They want to be able the people to do the sole interpretation. Right, right. And, and I, I think it, there, there's a mo much more demonic realm. I, I think you're right. You're, you're definitely right. But there's a much more demonic realm that they don't understand that they're, right. they're playing right into the hands of the devil while they claim to be serving Jesus Christ. Right. Right. Um, in 1539, we still haven't left uh, we still haven't left that century yet. The Great Bible, the first English Bible authorized for public use, is printed. Okay. Henry VIII wanted a Bible printed because Henry separated from the uh, from the Church of Rome, the Catholic Church of Rome, and he created what's known as today we call the Anglican Church today, the Anglican Church of England. Right. Why did Henry VIII do that? 
because he wanted his own religion, the Pope wouldn't grant him his divorce. All right. And so, you know, he had, what, several wives, six, and they were either, you know, either divorced them or beheaded them or... Mm -hmm. Or divorced and beheaded them. Right. So, um, so the church wouldn't uh, allow him his give divorce, him a divorce. He, so he started. He became the head of his own church. And what you shared last week that the uh, monarch of of England England still is the head of the Anglican Church. That's right. So head of state and and, head and, who, and who was that woman? What's her name? Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Right. Queen Elizabeth is not only head of the state but head of the Anglican Church. Right. in England to this day, which is why when her children or grandchildren or great-grandchildren are misbehaving publicly, uh, she's, she's got to do the best she can to squash it because she she's basically the head vicar. Mm-hmm. She's the vicar of the Church of England. And that's why, um, this is. I know this is old history and everything, but not as old as this. Um, Queen Elizabeth has sister, younger sister Margaret, and Margaret... Um, fell in love with a married man and he wanted to get a divorce from his wife but Elizabeth really had to put an end to the relationship and she did that by assigning he was in the military assigned him to some far off country for Antarctica, a couple of years right. to, to cool off mm-hmm. and um, you know she found interest in someone else that, that wasn't divorced so you know you, you couldn't even marry a, a divorced person back in the in the 50s right so yeah that, and, and, and now that's, that's changed the, that's changed right course. that's the 1950s because right because Prince Charles married Camilla all right so the first Bible of the Church of England this is not a Protestant Bible Mm-hmm. The first Bible of the Church of England is called the Great Bible, and King Henry VIII authorizes it. And King Henry VIII, he's a real bad dude. He's a sinner. <laughs> yeah, he's to put it lightly. So, you know, he, he's got women in the court that he's attracted to. They're attracting, they're intentionally trying to draw him away from yep. his whatever current numbered wife it was. You know, number mm-hmm. one, number two, and you got Anne Boleyn in there somewhere. And so... He not only wants to separate from uh, the Church of Rome, the Catholic Church of Rome, he wants to make his own prayer book, he wants to have his own Bible, and in part it's to turn up his nose at the Pope. Uh, But realize this at the same time, while all of this is going on, there's other denominations that are actually beginning to spring up that are not associated with the Church of Rome. They're associated maybe with the Russian Orthodox Church or, or the Coptic Church of Egypt. Never, or, or they're just they just springing out of the natural. See, see, Martin Luther was not the first one to split with the church. It had already been happening for decades and really for centuries. Uh, but those people generally were burned at the stake before uh, anyone uh, did a book report on them and it got put in the put in the news of right. uh, who got burnt at the stake this year. Right. So um, anyway, so uh, he published the Bible in English. King Henry VIII did. So now this is like a third and a fourth English translation done. And God used King Henry VIII, who was a wicked man, to do actually something that benefited all mankind. And this this, uh, uh, great Bible, as it was called, is a forerunner to the... uh, King James Bible, and King James being another English king. So he's doing this in 1539, and so we we see by the time we get up to 1611, which is only, we're only talking another, what, uh, 61 years, uh, 71 years, we actually have several kings in between Henry VIII and uh, King James. And so, but by this time, the Anglican Church has taken over in England, and then we talked about how later on, uh, right about this time after Henry VIII died, uh, Queen uh, Mary, called Bloody Mary, and then Queen Elizabeth. Uh, Queen Elizabeth is Protestant. Queen Mary is a devout Catholic. She wants to get England back into the, 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 the Roman Catholic roots, and she wants to wipe out everything that her father did. Uh, and she was, they call her Bloody Mary, because she just went around assassinating people that disagreed with her yeah. position on Catholicism. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so that happens. And then, uh, then in 1560... Uh, the Geneva Bible is printed in uh, Geneva, Switzerland. It was translated by English refugees, uh, and 
It becomes the Bible of the Protestant Reformation. So the Bible that was a product, the first Protestant Bible was not the Great Bible or the King James Bible. The first Protestant Bible was the Geneva Bible. And uh, the Geneva Bible, uh, there are some people today that have copies of the Geneva Bible in their libraries. Mm -hmm. And the reason why the Great Bible is considered the Great Bible, it was literally 14 inches high when folded flat. I mean, because the paper is thick right, and there are right. a lot of pages in it and all that. All right. So uh, every um, what was interesting about the Geneva Bible it was really the first study Bible in English. Uh, every chapter was accompanied by extensive marginal notes and references so thorough and complete that the Geneva Bible is also considered the first English study Bible. William Shakespeare quotes hundreds of times in his plays from the Geneva translation of the Bible. Now, I really find that fascinating when I talk about Shakespeare. How many people, how many uh, snooty blue buds go to see a Shakespearean play and, uh, and for, you know, laced with scripture all the way through it right? and then deny Jesus Christ? Right. In fact, one of the uh, chapters I was writing today was about the decision to just reject Jesus Christ offhandedly. So there was a study done um, by a professor out in California in 1961, and he wanted to do the odds on how many prophecies of Jesus were fulfilled and what the odds were that one man could actually fulfill those prophecies. So he goes, he just goes to the, he goes to one arbitrarily, I think arbitrarily, and he said the odds of, uh, he, he, he will be born in Bethlehem. So he, he figured out the odds, him and his students and submitted it to a paper and said, what are the odds of someone being born in Bethlehem to fulfill that scripture? And it was one in 300. Okay. And then he said, what are the odds to say that he'll be called a Nazarene? And it was like one in 3,000 or one in 16, whatever the numbers were. And then, and then he goes down, he only goes through eight prophecies of Jesus. Not the hundreds that are out there concerning having his hands pierced and him dying on a cross and having being, uh, and, and you know, all the children uh, shall be wailing and Rama and, and all the different things that happened to him. But he only got up to eight prophecies that were fulfilled, and it was as much as the class, I guess, wanted to calculate at that time. And they calculated that it was one to the 17th, no, 10 to the 17th power. So it was like a hundred million billion chances that one man could fulfill just eight prophecies of scripture all in one man. Wow. So the, the, the end result is this, that it's not like people can't believe in Jesus. Mm -hmm. They make a decision they're not going to believe in Jesus. Right. It's actually a decision. So and everyone, everyone, every nation on the planet, every religion, it, it knows about Christianity and knows about Jesus. But those that go to see Shakespearean plays, you walk out of a Shakespearean play and you make, you have to make a decision that the God, Yahweh God is not the God of the universe. You have to make a decision that Jesus is not his son. Mm -hmm. When Shakespeare himself acknowledges, as a Christian acknowledges Jesus as Lord and Savior. Right. Okay. Right. You know, how many people that walk out of Shakespearean play today or see a Shakespearean movie go, nah, I'm not, I'm not buying it. I love the play, though, but I'm not buying this Jesus thing. Anyway, uh, so every chapter, um, uh, in fact, this Bible gave us a lot of slang terms that we use today that was later used in the in the King James Bible, as I'll talk about. The Geneva Bible became the Bible of choice for over 100 years of English-speaking Christians. So from about 1560 to uh, up to at least uh, almost the 1700s, the Geneva Bible was the Bible of choice for 100 years of English-speaking Christians. That meant that the Geneva Bible was being used in the colonies that were being settled in the 1600s. You got the colonies, uh, you got like Plymouth being settled in 1621, 1620, 1621. And then you have Jamestown and other, other uh, places being settled later on. I was doing, I was reading, you saw me, this happened to me. So I'm reading this book, uh, this, this autobiography of Benjamin Franklin. And he goes on for a whole chapter to talk about this evangelist that he met and became great friends with until, until his death, uh, George Whitefield from England. Mm -hmm. 
and he begins to publish his materials. And even though at the time uh, he's skeptical about Christianity in general, he really likes this guy. And uh, he says the guy was the guy was the real deal. And then so I decided to go and read on George Whitfield out of another one, of, and I read some of the I read some of that to you. Right. And so these guys, George Whitfield. And these guys in the middle 1700s were not only familiar with the Geneva Bible, but they were also familiar with the King James Bible in depth. Anyway, so the Protestant Reformation uh, uh, uses the Geneva Bible for uh, over 100 years, right? And then now in 1582, dropping its thousand year uh old Latin policy, the Catholic Church of Rome produces the first English Catholic Bible called the Reigns New Testament from the Latin Vulgate. So it doesn't go back to the original Greek, right? It just goes back to the Latin Vulgate, so, which means it's going to have a lot of error in it. I happen to have uh, on my computer copies of what's known as the Douay Reims uh, New Testament. And I'm able to reference that and see what's being said in that. And I can have eight reference frames come up on just one scripture. And I can just scroll down as if I'm reading the Bible and read all eight right. reference frames. And the Douay Reims is one of them that I look at. All right, so by the 1580s, the Roman Catholic Church saw that it had lost the battles to suppress the will of God to have the Bible available in native languages. We found out last week that they were being translated into French, into German, into many other languages by this point. Uh, into Spanish and Portuguese. Anyway, so uh, in 1582, they surrendered their uh, fight for Latin only, decided that if the Bible was to be available in English, they would at least have to ha uh, give it the Roman Catholic seal of approval in an English translation. But they used the corrupt and inaccurate Latin Vulgate as the only tor uh, source of their text. And they went and they published the, the Bible anyway with all the distortions and corruptions that Erasmus had revealed and warned about 75 years earlier. Because it was translated at the Roman Roman Catholic College in the city of Reims, it was known as the Reims Bible. Uh, the Douay Old Testament was translated uh, by the Church of Rome in 1609, which is where I get my Douay Reims translation in my computer. So the Douay Old Testament and the Reims New Testament was put together, and uh, they made that available uh, together uh, later in 1609. In 1592, uh, Pope Clementine um, revised the Latin version of the Vulgate and brought it back to its original Greek roots of accuracy, and it became the authoritative Bible of the Catholic Church all over again. In 1603, Queen Elizabeth, who ruled from 1558 uh, to 1603, uh, with the death of Queen Elizabeth, uh, Prince James VI of Scotland became King James I of England. Now, this is where we're going to get the King James Bible. This is all happening in 1603, really only 400 and, what, 20 years ago, 23 years ago, 22 years. All right, so now we see the entrance of Queen Elizabeth dies. Her her successor is King James of England. So it goes like this. Henry VIII, bloody Queen Mary, and then Queen Elizabeth, and now King James I. All right? And they announced a desire for the Protestant clergy approached the new king in 1604 and said that they, they desired to have a new translation to replace uh, the Great Bible of 1568. They knew that the Geneva version had won the hearts of the people because of its excellent scholarship and accuracy and exhaustive commentary. However, they did not want the controversial marginal notes, which uh, talked about anti-Pope stuff all the way through it. And, and, and called the Pope the Antichrist. So, so was James a Catholic? Uh, James was Protestant, okay. all right? And um, he, so when did, the, when did it come out in print that the Pope was the Antichrist? It came out with the Geneva Bible because it was in the margins. And by the way, I have um, Matthew Henry's commentary that was written in right around 1725, I believe. And I have the six volume set and, and some people watching tonight, I've given them sets of the 
Matthew Henry commentary. It's an expensive set, but it's mm -hmm. worth it because it's good. One of the interesting things about Matthew Henry back in the 1700s, they hated the Pope. And anything they could do, this is important to our study, they hated the Pope so much that anything that even smelled Catholic, they tried to pull out of, of anything. And anything that smelled Catholic could be just wearing robes or having a service, which the Catholics didn't come up with on their own. Do you know where the Catholics and the Coptic Church and the Russian Orthodox Church got basically the, the, the what I'll call the, the air and the drama of a service? They didn't make it up. It came, came from Judaism. It came from the priest going into the temple and worshiping and honoring God and the priest coming back out and, and, and wearing robes that were specifically designed in the Mosaic era to be absolutely beautiful. And, 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 the, and the temple was to be beautiful and the array was to be beautiful. Remember what uh, the queen did when she came into Solomon's presence. She said, that his steps going up to the house of the Lord and everything else, the excellence of the cupbearers and everyone. She said there was no spirit left in her. God wanted the church to have such excellence. That's right. And so, you know, I remember when we first went on television, uh, one of my uh, employees at the time said, well, it's good enough for God. And I've never forgotten that. And I've heard other people say that, well, it's good enough for God. No, it's not. We should be so excellent that if some visitor comes here, right, there'll be no more spirit left in them. Right. That they will go, wow, the pastor preaches with excellence. The church, the people waiting on us and greeting us at the door, they're doing it with excellence. Right. Uh, everything about this ministry, everything about churches in general ought to be excellent. Yeah. Not just, yeah. not just yeah. the way the church looks, right. but right down to the message. Which is why, you know, I don't dust off messages and, and drag them in here. Right. And I go, oh, well, if it's good enough for God. You know, you, know, I got, you know, I got every message I've preached. I was looking at them yesterday and, uh, yesterday and this morning. I got every message that I've preached going back to prior to starting this church. Then yesterday I was looking at messages from 1998. Hmm. I was looking at messages this morning from 2003. I think I'll just dust off one of those messages. How many people heard my message from 2003 on the Holy Spirit? Okay, good. I'll just dust that off and bring that in on Sunday. No, I won't. Except for now you're smarter. <laughs> you, know? you can't really do that. I mean, I preach too. And, you know, you can look at a message that you preached in the past and then, you know, as you say, dust it off. But, it, but you, you're, 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 the Holy Spirit wouldn't let you do that. If you, if you really had the Holy Spirit in you, he would force you to relook at it because now you're older You've been through more, you've read the scripture more, and you understand it at a deeper level because, like we say, the scripture's got several layers. So maybe when you wrote that first message in 03, you were down on layer two. Well, you could be down on layer 12 now, you know what I mean? And so it, it's really difficult. I, I, I'm just saying it's very difficult to take that old message and dust it off and preach it because your, your heart and your mind and your soul, it's just not there anymore. Mm -hmm. and, and, you're, and you can see from writing that how immature you were mm -hmm. and how much you've grown. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Back then, I was still, I, I didn't know any Hebrew in 2000. Well, I didn't, I, I didn't know much Hebrew in 2003. I didn't know enough Hebrew to throw it out there and act like I knew it. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right, so um, there was a lot of anti-Pope stuff that came out into the Geneva Bible. So how long have people been calling the current Pope, whatever that age group is? About 500 years, huh? 500 years. So I've been saying 400 years. I should change that to 500 because it is validated mm -hmm. that the Geneva Bible had a lot of anti, they call it proclaiming the Pope. I have it written here, proclaiming the Pope to be the Antichrist. So every single time we get a new Pope now, the whole Protestant world erupts and goes, oh, he's the Antichrist. Well, every single time a Pope dies and they've got to go find themselves another Antichrist. And what's worse is People coming to my church or watching my broadcast are going, oh, Pastor, you really need to read this. You got to read how much this Pope is the Antichrist. Every single time we get a new Pope, I get all kinds of emails or I get things sent to me in the mail. Right. It's, 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 it's insane. Quit calling the Pope the Antichrist. You're not going to know who the Antichrist is. And by the way, the fallen prophet, the false prophet, is not going to be the, the, the Pope of the Catholic Church. No one even even accepts the Catholic Church hardly anymore. 
whether they're, whether they're in a Protestant church or they're just not churched at all. They're not going to go follow a, a pope as the, a as the false prophet in the book of Revelation in the, in the seven-year tribulation. They're not going to bother. Well, they're not well, going to waste their time. Most Catholics don't even follow the pope. Right. So, I mean, they, yeah, and, and the pope is pro-life. Yeah. How many Catholics are pro-life? Yeah. Um, I, I bet you it's less than I bet you it's less than forty percent. Right. I think the majority of, of practicing Catholics are not pro-life. When I say practicing, they go to a Catholic church, right. or they get married in a Catholic church, right? um, or they want to get married by a priest mm -hmm. somewhere. Right. Uh, anyway, so um, that was a translation. It was called the translation to end all translations, and uh, uh, they had about fifty scholars. Uh, um, edit it, right? So, in um, 1611, we're finally getting up to the King James Version. I still have to talk about Martin Luther yet. The King James Version, also called the authorized er uh, version of the Bible, is published. It is said to be the most printed book in the history of the world with more than one billion copies in print. From 1607 to 1609, the work was assembled. In 1610, the work went to press. In 1611, the first huge, 16 inch tall, okay, it's lying on its side like this, it's 16 inches tall, uh, so I, I guess that's one inch less than the Great Bible, because I think that was 17 inches, not 14. It was called then and known today as the 1611 King James Bible came off the printing press. The original King James Bible contains, listen to this now, the Apocrypha, and King James threatened anyone who dared to print the Bible without the Apocrypha. Wow. All right? And with heavy fines and a, a year in jail, only the, for the last 120 years as the Protestant church rejected this, uh, these books, the Apocrypha, and removed them from their Bibles. Uh, and we're going to find out that uh, Martin Luther did it for a period of time, but then after he died, the Reformation movement put those, put those books back in. It's only been in the last 120 years that they've begun to come out of the Bibles. This has left uh, most modern-day Christians believing that the popular myth that it, that is something that Roman Catholic that Roman Catholics came up with the apocrypha when it was available to Jesus in his day when it was in the early church and read from. Now you don't have to believe that the apocrypha is inspired, but it is great reading. And without the Apocrypha, you wouldn't have Maccabees 1 and Maccabees 2, which talks about how the Maccabees got back the temple from Antiochus and who slaughtered a pig on, on the altar. It's a true story. And not only a true story, but today we have Hanukkah or the Festival of Lights, which comes out at Christmas time. Oddly enough, can you imagine a festival being called the Holiday of Lights back 2,000 years ago, and who would have thought that the holiday of lights today is both Christmas and Hanukkah overlapping one another? Yeah. Isn't that something? Yeah, that's awesome. And God got that all figured out. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so, so a lot of people today believe the Apocrypha is, is Roman Catholic when it's not. But we've been told to believe that right. from modern day uh, teachers that are not so scholarly in their, in their research. Right. Okay, and when I do research, I don't come to my pulpit or sit up here and read anything that I haven't researched for long periods of time. In fact, this study, I was asked to give this study five, six, seven, eight years, well, six years ago, seven years ago, in 2014. Mm -hmm. Since 2014, I've been assembling this information. So I've spent a lot of time before I brought the Apocrypha and all this other teaching to you until I felt confident that I knew what I was talking about. But a lot of people that aren't scholarly go, well, you know, uh, Apocrypha is just Catholic. Yeah. No, it's not. Anyway. Uh, for only the last 120 years, the Protestant church rejected these books and removed them from their Bibles. This has left the most modern day Christians believing the popular myth that there is something Roman Catholic about the Apocrypha. There is, however, no truth to that myth and no widely accepted reason for the removal of the Apocrypha uh, since the 1880s. Uh, let's see. The Anglican Church's King James Bible took decades to overcome the more Protestant Protestant uh, uh, church's Geneva Bible. One of the greatest ironies of history, though, is that many Protestant Christian churches today embrace the King James Bible exclusively as the only legitimate English translation, yet it is not even a Protestant translation. Remember where the word Protestant comes from? Protesting. 
I am protesting this. Now, uh, King Henry VIII was certainly protesting Rome because he couldn't get a divorce by the Rome's Pope. But that's why he broke away from Rome's church, but he kept right. everything else right. pretty much in the same high mass order, which is why you see giant churches in England, why uh, the Anglican Church in England still loves to have people in these mass churches. That's right. Okay, anyway. Many Protestant, uh, Protestants are quick to assign blame for the persecution of the Roman Catholic Church, but I want to note that even after England broke from the Roman Catholicism in the 1500s, the Church of England, the Anglican Church, continued to persecute uh, Protestants right through the end of the 1600s. They burned them at the stake for not using the correct Bible. Um, and I have some examples of that here today. Protestants today are largely unaware of their own history and unaware of the Geneva Bible, uh, which is textually 95% the same as the King James Version. But the Geneva Bible has some things that are uh, much more accurate than the King James Bible. And, and people will probably get upset over that, but that's uh, just given people the history and the truth here, okay? The only way to obtain a true unaltered 1611 version of the King James Bible. Now, I talked about the 20 so or 20 or I think 24, you got the King James Bible, plus you have the new King James, plus you have translation updates that occurred every decade or so since 1611 or, or you know, maybe not as often as 16 a decade, but people were updating the King James Bible to get either error out of it or get it into a more, uh, a, a more readable English verbiage language. And so a lot of people, in order for you to obtain an, an unaltered 1611 version of the Bible, is either to purchase the original uh, from uh, pre-printed before 1769, or get a, a facsimile reproduction of the original 1611 King James Bible. And by the way, I'm going to do that. I am going to buy a facsimile. I'm going to make a note to my must buy. Maybe we'll have it on Amazon or something, right? <laughs> but it'll be come the fun to come out here and read it and, sh and read different verses of it and see how it agrees with the King James Bible of today. The first edition facsimile uh, reproduced uh, was produced in 1769 of the 1611 King James Bible, right? It has 20,000 spelling and punctuation changes and over 400 wording changes made to the original 1611. Okay. All right, now, before I go on any further to translations, what I want to do is talk about uh, Luther and the Apocrypha, okay? So, uh, fifth, by 1522, Luther had translated the New Testament and completed the full Bible by 1534, which included what is called today the Apocrypha. These extra books are, from, uh, are from originally from Judaism, not from Catholicism. The Apocrypha was written prior to Jesus going to the cross, every single one of them. Right, they were written by Jews. They were written and by Jews. And they're stories of Jews. And they're stories of Jews. Right? So you've got Judith, right? And Tobit, Judith, Tobit. Um, the Maccabees 1 and 2, Wisdom, uh, Sirach, uh, Ecclesiasticus. Right. Uh, very good, um, Kathleen. You're hitting on all cylinders here. Good memory. We've we read them for a long time. And, I, and I, right. I have a NASB, which doesn't have the Apocrypha in it. But, I mean, we read, you know, all growing up, we, I always thought the Apocrypha was exclusive to Catholics. Obviously, I'm wrong. But um, we, we grew up with these, you know, these books. Yeah, and there's a lot of Catholics today that, that think that the Apocrypha is exclusive to Catholicism when it's really not. It really isn't. Uh, the, the Apocrypha is still being used in the Russian Orthodox uh, Church, and it's still being used in the Coptic Church in Egypt. And 10% of Egypt is Coptic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? Amen. So, Amen. Anyway, um, Luther did not translate directly from the Latin Vulgate. Uh, for people back then, that amounted to heresy. He actually uh, went, he learned Greek the usual way. And so then he went, he could translate Greek into, into Latin or Greek into German, okay. which he started to do. And this is why he found out that the, uh, the Latin Vulgate had a lot of error in it. Uh, he just said, okay, this is error. So part of his problem wasn't with the Catholic Church. It was w with how badly the translations kept on getting, they kept on getting worse and worse. So his thesis that he nailed to the Wittenberg 
church door wasn't about so much the Catholic Church, but it, 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 it was, but it was also uh, why allow this, this terrible translation to where it is today when we have the Greek that we could go back to and translate it back into Latin if we wanted to, or into German as he chose to do, right? right? Uh, Wycliffe included the Apocrypha. He also threw in uh, two Ezra's and uh, a bonus, uh, 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 called a bonus letter, Paul's letter to the La Laosidians, which we don't have, we don't have today in our in in the Apocrypha today. All right. All right. So now, what happened in the King James version or Authorized Version of 1600s? There was a lot of uh, new slangs that came out of the uh, both the Geneva Bible and then later the King James Bible. Many of the these are turns of phrase by the skin of my teeth is in the both the Geneva Bible as am I my brother's keeper? I came out of the Geneva Bible and the King James Bible. Uh, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. These are all terminologies that we say very quickly today, if we're in Christianity. But the way that they, if you were to translate from Latin into English or, or Greek into English, you wouldn't have translated it that way. Um, uh, some people are a law unto themselves. Uh, Anyway, so these are phrases that we use today automatically in Christianity and without Luther and without the Geneva Bible and then ultimately then the King James Bible, we wouldn't know uh, phrase sections of, of the Bible. Okay, right. so the Geneva Bible had more uh, vivid and vigorous language and became uh, more popular than the Great Bible uh, for a period of time, as I talked about. So... We talked about here. Uh, the Geneva Bible was the first to produce the English Old Testament translation entirely from the Hebrew text. Like its predecessors, it included the Apocrypha, and I, I'm not keeping harping on that, but I had, just have so much uh, to say about this. Also included the story of Susanna, uh, the history of the destruction of Bel and the dragon, which I have copies of in one of my Bibles, and I've read them, and they're just, they're odd. It's odd reading them. But whether they're odd reading or not, uh, they've been in the, I'm, see, what, what ends up happening, if one person over one denomination makes, says, I want to include or exclude a particular book of the Bible, what they're, they're running amok in their ego in which one man shouldn't have that kind of power. That's right. The Bible has come at least for, for the most part, up until the 1500s, it's come through the ages, produced by the sages, I ought to write that down, produced by the sages of 2,000 years mm -hmm. of editing what's, what's actually good and what's actually not so good. Right. Uh, so Luther begins to take some stuff out. All right, so why did Luther remove inspired books from the Bible? Um, so... Uh, it was by the apostolic tradition that the church discerned which writings are to be included of the sacred books, all right, which is uh, ages by the sages. Uh, admit all the damage Martin Luther did in rendering uh, the body of Christ before th he, he shortened the list of canon of scripture. And he believed that the Catholics added the books into the Bible because he didn't know, he, he didn't know the history of that. What he didn't know is uh, he said, um, "He said this is not what God really wanted." So one man began to took these, take these books out of the Bible. Now he took out the Book of Revelation during his life later on in, in his life. So then he was printing Bibles like without the Book of Revelation. Uh, and Luther claimed that whatever celebrated Judaism uh, um, or what celebrated Catholicism, he just arbitrarily threw them out. Uh, let me. In fact, uh, Luther's first German translation was missing 25 books. It was missing uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, um, and that's what he he had the, the the. And we know that he was trying to just get it published. He said he referred to the the book of James in the New Testament, he said, straw not worthy to be burned uh, in my oven as tinder. 
So he didn't like certain books of the New Testament. So he just arbitrarily pulled out James. He arbitrarily pulled out uh, the book of Revelation. He said the rest are Judaizing nonsense. Subsequent Protestants declared that Luther wasn't really inspired by the Holy Spirit by removing those books. And the following Protestant movement, the continuing Protestant movement, right. replaced most of the books that he had removed. All right, so that's both from the Old and the New Testament. All right. Um, so we have 66 books of the Bible today in the Protestant Bible. But it hasn't always been that way. Right. Uh, so it's been anywhere, it's been anywhere from uh, 77 books to 80 books to 84 books, depending on which Bible was written in English over the last four and 500 years. And I'm, all, you know, and I'm not trying to have a, a move of the Holy Spirit include these books, but I think it's fascinating. We're free from, from the law and we're free from bad, erroneous teaching that's, um, that hasn't done its research by saying that. So when I first started this church, I knew what the truth was. I couldn't mm -hmm. prove it. I couldn't prove it like I'm proving it tonight in, last, in the last two weeks. But I, I am very careful to quote from the Apocrypha. Until, of all things, I saw, I started to see back about 15 years ago, big name preachers that are completely anti-Catholic reading from the Apocrypha in their messages, actually reading it from the pulpit. And I thought to myself, you know, I gotta get over this fear of being judged by my, my peers. Well, if you, can, if you can go into the book of Josephus, which is history, you can go into the book of Irenaeus, which is about the heresies, and you can go into um, uh, different ones. The Eusebius. Eusebius. Mm -hmm. Then why can't you go into the Apocrypha, which was in the Bible? You right. know, and like, like I said, I just, wasn't I just in the got Bible. an education from this as well. I did not know that those were not, I thought they were, I've always thought they were exclusively Catholic books, and I thought that people were missing out because there's a lot of good information in there. Why would you and, remove and the so, Book of Wisdom? Right. And if you read the Book of Wisdom, which is in the Apocrypha, you go, who pulled this out? Yeah. So it's only been missing from Protestant Bibles for 120 years. And so you got to know your history. It's just good to know your history. Right. It's good to know your history, and it's good to be read. Right. You know, and and um, it's good to, you know, and so if I, I, I've seen, in, in the last 10 years or so, I've seen videos online, particularly mm -hmm. the last couple of years, of people that are just mocking the Apocrypha. Right. And then they mock Constantine. They say, well, Constantine, you know, was a devil that just forced Christianity on everyone. No, he wasn't. He was saved. His son was saved. His wife was saved. His wife built all these giant churches in, in, in Israel. She, mm -hmm. she paid for them out of her own pocket. Anyway. Yep, the uh, so Jesus. it's good to do some research, yeah. right? Uh, Luther argued that the Catholic Church had no right to decide matters of canonicity and completely disregarded that he awarded himself the very right to edit the canon while he's making fun of the church and its elders. So we're not protecting the Catholic Church by any means. But the reality is there was only one church. Without the Catholic Church, we would have the Coptic Church and we would have the Russian Church. That would, that's, that's all. And the Catholic Church didn't start out. Catholic, again, means universal. That's where the term comes from. The term Catholic is used in, the, in Irenaeus' 600-page book. I've read almost every page, repeatedly. I mean, it's a book that I've dog-tailed. Mm -hmm. And he, where he, talk, he uses the term Catholic repeatedly to refer to the universal church. And why should the universal church uh, be united on everything? Because it is, as, as a universal church, it should be united to the unsaved world. Why did why? we move? Right. Irenaeus points out how we began to move to Sunday worship and not Saturday worship is to show us ourselves unified. Right, right. As a church that we're not, we're not copying Judaism. Mm -hmm. But there's other really great well, reasons why. Bible is, an, is it, we Americanize that word, but that means books. Right, right. So anyway, yep, um, we, we didn't go into more depth, but uh, if I want to, I could maybe next week, we'll see. I could talk in depth about the King James Version and all the changes that were done in that one. Let's all stand. 
Father, we thank you for this teaching here tonight. And Father God, I ask that not one word would be robbed from anyone here or anyone watching this anytime in the future. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. and amen. Father, I ask that you give me a great message for Sunday amen. Uh, for our congregation here and, and for those watching. And Father God, that our television broadcasts bring in uh, more saints and, and get more people baptized in the Holy Ghost than ever before as we have our first teaching on uh, prophecy in tongues from back from three weeks ago coming on television this Sunday. And Father God, I ask that we have more people watching more than ever before and that you use this ministry to bring revival and create revival in this, in this state Amen. and in this country and in the world. And Father God, we humble ourselves before you knowing that anyone can bring revival, but only you can orchestrate it, Father God. And Father God, we ask for your spirit uh, to dwell here and that power and signs and wonders come out of every one of our services in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. amen. So this is Pastor Dave and Catherine Gonzalez saying, Press into God. And he'll press into you. And we'll see you again here this Sunday at the mountains.